Welcome to the Race Factory. Tonight I'm going to talk to my good friend Tim Siebel. The Siebel family has uh, made headlines and uh, been winning races uh, for more than 70 years, 75 actually. But before we talk to Timmy, let's have a look at this little intro I made. Timmy, 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 my good friend, what the hell was happening here? Well, I don't know. I didn't get to see any of it. What is it? it? <laughs> I've been trying to, to dig up some material to make an intro for you, and I chose the uh, San Diego uh, when you was out there leading the race. I mean, I think it was Rinker who was behind you, and you barrel in front of all the audience, didn't you? No, that was in a heat race in San Diego, <laughs> not in the final. Oh, and okay. that was, I think that was Foster behind me. It was Foster. Because Foster and I were fighting for the championship that year, and it came down to the last race, and that was right after 9-11. So we, had to, we ended up, uh, Debbie and I, my wife, drove out to the race uh, together instead of flying like we were going to because of all the chaos yeah, yeah. from the aftermath. But... Um, yeah, so in a heat race, uh, I got tagged in the back by a lapper, went over, and uh, it ultimately cost me the championship. Already we have uh, people uh, sending comments and greeting, and this is uh, Carlos Guzman. He says, good to see you, Timmy. So ah. I'm encouraging everyone who is watching us tonight to post a comment. Uh, I'm sure Timmy is going to answer most of them if I let them pass the uh, <laughs> the bar here. Ken, oh, yeah. McCr Ken McCrory from uh, from UK is uh, on saying, great to see you guys. Uh, Gregory Dennis, hey Timmy. So a lot of uh, good people are, are going to join us and, and be with us uh, tonight. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, I just want to start out by saying I, I want to uh, give a shout out and, and thank you to all the first responders and all the people that are the doctors, the nurses, all the workers that are are vital uh, to everybody's survival during this terrible coronavirus. And I just want to uh, say thank you. It's a lot of new heroes nowadays, aren't there? It sure is. And, and um, you know, the whole everybody's normal is shifted. Yep. So now what we took for granted maybe uh, is not so easy anymore. And uh, we got to think about not only uh, how we do things, but also how it impa impacts 
uh, everybody else around us and our neighbors. So, mm-hmm. you know, like, like they're saying, we're all in this together, but um, together we'll pull out of this as well. I hope so. And like our good friend Abdul Salam uh, would have said, inshallah, he joined us now from uh, Abu Dhabi, where they're doing a fantastic job uh, fighting the COVID-19. So uh, let's um, let's see. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about that uh, on a later stage, but sh- but uh, I would like to uh, to talk to you about your racing history, Timmy, because you have been there for a long time. And uh, I, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> well, I think it's good because there's got to be a lot of good stories. Oh, there is. You know, it's um, it, it's there's stories along the way and and friends and experiences, but. Uh, now, yeah, we'll cover as much as much of it as everybody wants to hear, and and as much as we can say. I have had some help, and uh, Steve Michael, the voice, he is older than I think. If we add the both of us, he would still be older than that, you know. <laughs> but that means he has a lot of experience, and he has helped me out with uh, some questions tonight. And uh, I'm going to pick up uh, a few of them. And he said, uh, Timmy, since you were really the youngest in line in the Siebel family, do you feel you could have started in the sport earlier in life? Or did your father, Bill, get you started as soon as you were ready to test the waters of the sport? Well, that's that's kind of funny because... I don't think he realized how early you started. <clears throat> no. And my grandfather is the one. So, so my older brother, Mike, uh, Michael and I started at the same time. So we were running J-Hydro. And back then, there was a group of kids around the St. Louis area because Tim Chance made the boats right right in town. Friend of your da- and, uh, grandpa. Yeah, and my grandfather got us started. So it was a lot of fun. You know, back then, you worked on them, yeah. you tested a heck of a lot more than you raced. Okay. But it was all good. And, I, and so when we initially started, Michael's five years older than I am. So he was... Uh, I, I was eight. He was 13. Wow. So when we started, um, you're supposed to be 10. My grandpa told him I was 13 so I could race. <laughs> Twin brother <And>, Mike. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, it was uh, it was a heck of a lot of fun, though, getting started. And and uh, they every time we'd go out to test, they'd put just enough gas in because you never came in until you ran out of gas. So they never put much gas in them. Because you'd never be looking at sure, you'd just be out there in a group testing, going around. That has gone on for a long time because you visit me in Norway, and I mean, okay, it's maybe fifteen years ago, even twenty, but we were adults, and and you were still running out of gas then because you didn't want to to let the other guys beat you. <laughs> so, no, no, that's that's when I jumped in the the little V bottom. Yeah, the wind race. What is it the GT thirty or whatever yes, it was? That's correct. And. Uh, Got my ass kicked by the uh, by all the kids. <laughs> ah, well, in the end, you didn't. You was actually competing with them, and I think that you were in front when you ran out of gas, so I had to pull you back in. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Typical. Well, that's that's uh, part, and you quoted actually your uh, uh, your dad after that one, you know. So uh, he said something like, uh, "Yeah, he." The, you're the guy competing with you. He ran out of gas and you won. So he said, <laughs> you said something like, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lucky beats good all the time. All the that's time. how I won some championships. <laughs> um, you, are most prob- you are most probably the most famous race family. Did you ever come to Europe? I mean, uh, Ken and uh, the European uh, stay, they know that both Mike and Bill raced in uh, for for two uh, for at least a decade or two, from in the eighties and nineties. But the, did you ever race in Europe? The only time I raced in oh. Europe was the one time with you when we went to uh, Croatia. That was the that time was when it. Michael drove all the way from Germany down to to uh, <laughs> to to, to uh, where was it? Far down in Italy, and he had to turn around and drive all the way back. So he spent oh, yeah. three days of commuting. Yeah. That was that was the only time because when when we were um, when my dad my, obviously my dad raced in Europe for many many years seventeen and I guess so did my brother I think the first time my my brother went to and raced in Paris was he was sixteen or seventeen yeah 
Mm-hmm. So for me, after I, I was done in high school, I went to college. So that kind of hurt uh, those opportunities. And then when I, when I got out of college, then I ran the family business, which was making the pleasure boats. Mm-hmm. So again, that would allow me to You were doing the business and the, and the other guys were raising. Yeah. And then, and then after that, I started my own business and never went over there until I raced those races in China. Speaking about college, uh, I remember well that you were also into wrestling, and that's uh, how you got through college, basically, wasn't it? On a wrestling scholarship, did uh, yes. did that sport uh, help you uh, particularly in powerboat uh, racing? Well, wrestling, wrestling, I believe, has helped me in more ways than just that because it's the dedication and. And that is the biggest thing with wrestling. It, you know, people that see or have wrestled, they either love it or hate it. Mm-hmm. And if you love it, the dedications there, the things that you put yourself through uh, that you don't know that you can do also helps you. So at the end of a race, when everybody's tired mm-hmm. and you've got to still be mentally sharp mm-hmm. and your body's drained, that is training for how to keep you going. Hmm. Um, wrestling helped. And I'll tell you another thing that tremendously helped me was road racing motorcycles. Really? Because, yeah, because with road racing, it's an extended period of time that you have to have that concentration level. Hmm. But yet you've got to have a, a keen awareness of everything that's going on around you, much like boat racing. Hmm. So with that, You've got to be able to focus without really focusing on it. Mm -hmm. So in boat racing, you know, you, you don't, you can't have the tunnel vision. You've got to have what's going on all around you and not necessarily have to concentrate just what's right in front of the boat. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, probably gonna probably gonna ask my uh, my uh, friend here at the race factory then to to try his bike because he's also racing uh, road racing. So oh uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. So we have uh, we have uh, one for that as well. Um, how do you think the current F one drivers uh, would do on the rough base city circuit? And did that race ever have any similarity to Bristol in uh, England? Would you say? Well, it does in the fact that it is got uh, seawalls down both sides, mm-hmm. and it's a narrow race course, so it it's it's up and back, and it gets you get the crosswinds there. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have the high walls like Bristol does, and it doesn't have the snaking uh, through the city like Bristol does, rather than just straight up and back. Um, so I never I never got to race at Bristol. But uh, I watched my dad do it several times, uh, only only on video. I've never been there in person. You've never been there? Ken no. McGorry, he says that we remember Billy as the king of Bristol, and that was probably due to the fact when he beat the OMCs. Huh? He went out and first he won the OM, and then he went out and, and won the OSET again. Well, he did, and in, in, uh, my dad won that race for the first time in 1978. And at the time, he was the first American ever to go and win that race. And they used to have this beautiful trophy yeah. that was under lock and key and guard. Yeah. And uh, so that thing, I at the time, it was worth a tremendous amount of money. Mm. And if it supposedly the story was, if you won it uh, a few times in a row, they were going to give you that. Wow. Well, my dad, my dad ended up uh, winning that race five times. Really. Yeah, and one of that those uh, times, uh, Mike, your brother, he ended up in a very nasty, which has been a a what can I say YouTube virtual uh, clip uh, when he uh, hooked and went straight into the wall. Oh yeah, they were they were racing for Budweiser at the time, and it was probably 87, 87 88 yeah. range. Yeah, yeah. Can imagine. it was right when the four blade propellers came out, and Mike was running a four blade. Mm-hmm. And came around the a right hander there at Lost Bite, and when it did, it stuffed and ripped the whole sponson off. I've seen that clip over and over and over again. Speaking about uh, race courses and circuits, 
uh, which one was your favorite? If you should I would one. say, hand, hands down, my favorite was the old St. Louis course at George Winter. Yeah. Because the cool thing about that course was, you know... Um, you were in Siebel country, that's what they said. Well, yeah, yeah, that's that's one of Michael Warner's quotes. Yeah. <laughs> to win here, you have to be a Siebel. <laughs> but that was the good old days. But for me, I like that course because it didn't matter if you were in lane one or lane five. You could move around the course and you can pass people. And there was a lot of passing going on. Some guys ran tight, but you could sweep it because of the way the layout was with the corners. Okay. And... Um, it was just a great place to race and a very difficult place to race for me because, you know, you'd have so much anticipation uh, build up for the for the races. And and a lot of times you would have a bad weekend there. I think my dad raced there several years before he ever won it. Oh, OK, but he was also organizing. I know that feeling, by the way, you know, to organize a race and to try to race it. It's almost impossible. I mean, you are making it so much easier for your competitors, you know, because you're oh, all yeah. over the place and everybody wants to talk to you and everybody needs tickets and boots and, you know, the whole... I can imagine uh, when how that, uh, how that must have been. The easiest thing you can do in boat racing is be the racer. Easiest. Easiest thing. Because all you have to do is you got to worry about you and your team. Yeah, exactly. And that's concentrated, all of that, and, and, of course, your sponsor. But once you get, you know, I said this for years and years, once you get to the final on Sunday and you're strapped in that boat, yeah. there's only one person that you're, you're out there running for, and that's yourself. Of course, of course. Sven Krekels from uh, Germany, he says, Hello from Germany. Can I ask Tim something private? Pineapple on a pizza, yes or no? <laughs> that was a question for Sean the other night as well. <laughs> I, I saw that. I saw that, yeah. Um, you know, I, I it's it's not mandatory by any means, but uh, I have definitely had a Hawaiian pizza before, that's for sure. <laughs> that's a good one in my book. <laughs> you raced in so many classes, Timmy, in APBA. And uh, when you worked your way up to be the most winning driver in, in Formula One in, in the US. But which class was uh, your favorite on the way uh, there? I mean, uh, tell us a little bit about the different classes. You have told us that you, you ran uh, J Hydro as the start when you were eight. I ran J Hydro and then I ran, um, I would do a couple races maybe, uh, especially at that time, but I ran a sea service runabout. Uh, my grandpa had traded some props for a for a motor, okay. and then we borrowed a boat off of Polly Bogosian, yeah. and uh, we ran it, we ran Sport E, we ran Mod 50, ran Mod 50 a lot, ran Formula 100, uh, SST 120, SST 140, Mod 90, um, Champ, Mod U, uh, and the current, you know, F1. Yeah which back then was F1 Sport. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had um, a variety of classes that I ran and, and boats and manufacturers of boats. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say the biggest growing, uh, something that you never stop learning. So every time you get in the boat and you test or race, you're always learning something new but mm -hmm. man i had a lot of fun in mod 50 because mod 50. we ran mercury mod 50 yeah. and the omcs were faster uh -huh. yeah but in and that's where i really uh first got on the national circuit so a lot of the guys brought me under their wing and taught me a lot of stuff but it was all omc drivers yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it was terry leatherby it was jimbo mcconnell um, I probably learned more off of those two guys than anybody else uh, for a long, long time. So, Stephen Michaels, the voice, he had the question, you raced Mod VP back in the 80s. How did you enjoy that class and the race in St. Louis? 
and the Mod VP title was always a Mercury versus OMC battleground. Did you get any pressure from Mercury to put the hammer down and keep the cup for Mercury Powerhead boats? Well, Mod VP and I had a love hate relationship. <laughs> so that's how you know, with racing is. Yeah. So when we first started Mod VP, there was no weight rule, there was no engine rules. The only engine rule was that it had to be a cer certain cubic inch mm -hmm. and you couldn't run alcohol. Okay. So we were making the boats as lighter and lighter and lighter. Of course. So the last Mod VP boat I had, I think, weighed 320 pounds. In kilos, so how they, much is that? These were, these were um, well, 2.2, so oh, yeah. for a kilo. Yeah. So it's it was light. <laughs> and... And you had unrestricted two fours on there. Mm -hmm. And um, we were always messing around with the, the design. Yeah. But you couldn't drive them like you could a tunnel boat. No. So I cra I think I crashed 10 races in a row at one point. <laughs> 10 races in a row. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I was the test dummy. My dad would try something new on the bottom. <laughs> and, and you wasn't was even strapped in. No, you weren't strapped in. He... Yeah. The bottom of the Mod VP boat has the extra pod in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he squared all that off. Okay. And then on the back straightaway in St. Louis, you could float turn turn uh, two. Okay. Well, I was floating around there, and you're just sitting in a seat. You're not strapped in, no capsule. And that thing would hook as you're trying to float it. And I had, I'd end up on the side of the boat. <laughs> Still in the cockpit, but my left foot on the gas, and I'd have to scoot over going back down the straightaway until finally I went straight through the side. Cracked the whole boat in half long ways. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Took that one to the dump. <laughs> I can't imagine. Tell us about how you felt every summer as a youngster about uh, the hype and drama of watching your father and, and your brother Michael. And uh, when the family take, took on the world uh, for the UIM titles back in the late 70s and 80s, that must have been a thrill. But how was the, how was the feeling? How bad did you then want to go out and race Michael and race your dad? I mean, oh, uh, well, I got to tell you, you know, everybody when they're growing up, uh, a lot of people, everybody has people you look up to, heroes. Sure. And, um, you know, for me, it just happened to be my family. Mm. So between my grandfather and my and my dad and my older brother, Mike, you know, I wanted to be them. I didn't want to be a baseball player or a football player or anything else. I wanted to be a boat racer. So when I was at school, you know, I'd be drawing race boats and thinking about that. I was getting in trouble because I was thinking about that instead of, of course, doing my schoolwork. Normal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Me, so. My mom did not want me to race. She <laughs> I don't know any mom who would like any <laughs> their kids to race. But uh, and once you grow older, you know you you start to understand them a bit. That that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, then it shifts from your mom to your wife. <laughs> Do you know how my mom th taught me how to read? She bought me English magazines with your dad and Michael Werner uh, in them, you know. So I was actually reading English before I, I learned to read Norwegian. I was so poor in school. <laughs> I, math and sciences and all that, no no interest. But, you know, if you gave me a PowerBook yeah. magazine, you know, like I studied, you know, because I wanted to, to, to know what uh, Mr. Bill and Michael uh, oh, yeah. talked about, you know, race so, reports I'm from... I mean, it was always a lot of fun, you know, back back starting in the Team Mercury days. So, you know, they'd take a month getting ready for the St. Louis race because back then, OMC versus Mercury yeah. at the St. Louis race was the biggest. That and probably Parker uh -huh. were the biggest two things in Havasu at one time as well. Yeah. But uh, that was huge racing. Right. So I would go with my dad up to Oshkosh while he tested. Then I hung out with all the, you know, Jimmy Herring and, you know, Jimmer Kabasha and, and Jamie Shunky. So all the guys that were on Team Mercury, I'd hang out with their kids for a week. 
Yeah. While my dad did the testing, of course, and then they come down to say Alan Garbrick. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a lot of fun and it was fantastic for me growing up at that time because I was so into it mm. and to hang out and and grow up with Earl Bentz and Reggie Fountain and Buck Thornton and yeah. you know Bert Sarah and all those guys. It was it was tremendous. Do you think they had uh, an easier way around? Because, uh, you know, Michael Werner is a very good friend of mine and uh, he is telling me stories. I hope half of it's, if it, it's true, you know, because then it's damn good stories. But no, my my uh, question is really, do you think that uh, the, uh, the, the race drivers had it easier back then when there was factory racing? I mean, now we struggle to get the funds together. We, we have to do our own marketing. You know, we the drivers have to do so much more than just uh, be a test driver. I mean, Michael took me to the old uh, Mercury Racing Factory in Belgium, you know, and, and walked me around and told me the story and so on, you know, and he was like, he told me once a year he was uh, signing up with Liquid Molly, a check, and uh, the rest of the year he was uh, working for, for having his boat go faster. Do you think they had it easier? Uh, or Well, I, it's for sure changed. And, you know, powerboat racing and watercraft racing has a lot of similarities with the factories being involved and then the money's raised and, mm -hmm. and it elevates the level of the sport. And then after that, then the factories pull back and all of a sudden the, the, the sport is left with a big hole in it. Mm -hmm. um, not only from a funding side, but also from... Um, promotional side and and media coverage mm. so it's all changed and it all evolves and and it's it's very difficult to say um because now you have to be politically correct and you have got to do this and this and this mm. if you're considered a good viable option for uh sponsorship I, uh, back in the day, if you won races, yeah. you were the guy for sponsorship. Exactly. So now it's more important about how you promote yourself and the brand mm. and the brand ambassador being the brand ambassador mm. than it is about going out and getting first place on Sunday afternoon. Ken it all ties together. Yeah. But Ken McCrory, he said, would you like to see more engine manufacturers involved? Personally, I really enjoyed watching Mercury and OMC battle it out. Always, you know, it elevates it elevates the competition. It elevates the products that they they put out because yeah. they're they're doing it not only to promote their product, no. but to beat their competition. Mm -hmm. So um, more manufacturers in would definitely be a benefit in my eyes. Yeah. I don't know if that will ever happen again, mm -hmm. but, you know, competition, that's just like, um, you know, for me, one of, one of the reasons that I was able to get the, to the level I, um, I progressed to was the fact of me and my older brother, mm -hmm. you know, and my dad, yeah. because the competition between us. Okay. So, when we were all three racing the same class, I didn't care where I finished, as long as I was head of, ahead of those two. I can so imagine. I could get third to last as long as they were behind me. <laughs> and that I, would be a successful day. I actually had a guy commenting when I posted the show that, that, was gonna be, uh, that you were going to be on here. And he said that um, I bought a Harley once uh, in 94 uh, and that what used to belong to Tim Siebel because he crashed the boat so bad he had to sell even his Harley. Is that a true story? <laughs> well, I don't know if that's true or not. It might be. <laughs> I, did have, I had a Harley at one time and I used to road race it because oh, they really? picked it. Yeah, the, it was called Twin Sports Class, oh. and they used to pay good money. Yeah, back yeah. then you could win thirty five hundred bucks for winning a national. So really? that was one of my bikes. Let's pop up with another question here. Uh, we have a lot of good questions coming in. Do you know how many Siebel tunnel boats were built over the years? I think your series is awesome for the sport in the U.S. The coverage is excellent on the marketing side. Do you have any plans on a West Coast race? That was Matt Yarno. Yeah. 
Sorry for the pronouncing. Oh, that's okay. Um, well, thank you for the the comments, and uh, I'm glad you're following us. You know, we're working really hard to expand our footprint in the U.S., mm -hmm. and that's one reason that we went back to uh, Windsor, Colorado last year, mm -hmm. working our way towards the West Coast, so we'd love to be out there. Um, I, I'm sorry, and hit the beginning of that one again, Frodo? Yeah, and uh, he asked if you know how many sea boat, tunnel boats were built over the years. I think there was somewhere around um, eight or nine hundred really? over the years. Yeah. But you got to remember, you know, that was a that was about a forty five years that we've we've built these things. Mm -hmm. And you still build them? Still build them? Uh, not as many by any means. But you know, that's all coming around with the series. Um, now we've got new guys coming in. Mm -hmm. We've got guys that have been competing that want new equipment. So Rick Hoffman um, is making a new composite boat over here, and R.J. West, the composite crafts. Mm -hmm. So we've had two guys step up in the Formula One class. They look good and uh, are competitive, and and they're they're great boats. Yeah, and it, it's uh, in fact they're on our uh, safety committee um, along with Rourke Summerford, who built the STVs forever. Mm -hmm. So we we reach out to all these guys for help mm -hmm. because, you know, one one idea or one person uh, can't do as well as the input of 10 people. No, so exactly. we're relying on the expertise mm -hmm. of several people to try and promote and further the the racing in the U.S. Yeah. Paul Furman from uh, UK has uh, joined all our show till now, and he asks, uh, how popular is tunnel boat racing in the US? Does it receive good TV coverage? Because in the UK, it's not easy to view on TV anymore. Paul. Television coverage anymore um, has changed. You're, you get as good a TV coverage as you can pay for, okay. to be honest with you. That's it. So, so the... The, we had CBS Sports um, coverage, mm -hmm. uh, Sports Network, and it goes out to about 66 million homes in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's very good. And the we partnered with Greenlight, um, who does our production, mm -hmm. and they also get us placement all over the world. So it's about 740 million homes all over the world that ours has been able to be in. Hmm. That's uh, that's good. So uh, and and also uh, you are starting to live stream a lot more. We started to live stream last year. Uh, we did both, and it creates some challenges. Okay. Because when to to do it economically now, hmm. what we have to do is we have to have an on site, so they're just not there filming. So we have to take the on site. We have to have a mobile yeah. um, production area, yeah. and then we've got cameras in place. They're switching, so we're also doing the live. We got Tommy there doing the live uh, commentating, yeah. but then we're also taking that footage and then making a show out of it later uh, that goes on CBS. Robert Trullian said, uh, kudos on putting on the greatest series in the U.S. You all have an amazing thing, and I love being a part of it. So, uh, good comment from Robert there. Yeah, Robert's great, you know. Him and, uh, him and Jason Bonanno um, are a Formula Lights team, and his brother actually builds some boats, Paul. Oh, yeah. And Paul raced Formula Lights for years. So, he's making a brand new hull for them now that they're hoping to debut provided we get back to racing. But that's that's something funny. You see throughout boat racing, whether it's in the U.S. or around Europe or in Japan, is the fact that you've got multi-generations of a family yeah. racing. Mm -hmm. So so it's, it's, it's really special when everybody comes together and if there's a lot of camaraderie, although everybody doesn't mean that they're national necessarily best friends no. but there's a lot of camaraderie where we'll help each other um, to make it better for the whole jason Peniston says uh, hi tim hope all well what would you say has been your favorite st louis race memory in the many classes that you have raced 
Well, hi, Jason. Jason, uh, Jason's dad was involved with boat racing, Charlie, over in Bermuda. Okay. So we went over, and my dad raced with Ken Deere for years and years and years over there. Okay. But um, I have to say the time that um, I blew over and went into the woods in the SST 140. I, and think then I, have, I think I have a clip of that. Hang on a second. What the hell happened there? <laughs> well, we were, well, I was racing for uh, Bobby Donaldson and Billy Joel of B&B, and that was a composite Seabold. Thanks God and, for that. Uh, what's that? Thanks God for that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, we, we came down, and we we're coming into turn three down the back straightaway at the start of the race, and, uh, and uh, one of the Miller boys went to set it, and when he did, I set mine, and his came out a little bit, and he got under me, and it blew me over. Well, you turn in between an island yeah. in, in the peninsula of the land right there. Yeah. So when it went over, it went over, and it hit. And when it first hit, I was like, oh, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> but then it went back up in the air, and it kept going. <laughs> so when it finally hit, thankfully – um. You know, it, I hit, I came to a stop. Yeah. I'm holding my breath because there's no water in the capsule yet. <laughs> so I'm like, I hit so close to land that it just, it yeah. splashed it away and it hasn't come back in. Yeah. I was worried because it's very shallow there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm holding my breath and I'm, I release myself. I look down, there's branches in the cockpit with me. Amazing. I'm like, what the hell? I must have ended up on the land. Yeah. So I, I'm small, I turn around, I'm sitting on the ground because the boat's upside down and I'm the under. The wrestling thing helped you, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, this thing could be on fire. Yeah, of so course. I'm just getting excited. It's not like I'm going to pick it up off myself. No. Luckily, Stoner, the cameraman, yeah. came over because I flew right. He set the camera down and I flew right over the camera. You see the shadow go right over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he came over, tilted up, and I crawled out. So it it broke the motor. The motor was still with the boat, but it broke it off the boat, mm. and it cracked the boat in half, oh. but it didn't break it completely in half. I think I have so a picture of you uh, in that uh, time then. Let me see. Yeah, here we go. I have a beautiful picture of you with a mustache and... Uh, no, oh. that, was, that was years <laughs> later. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I did a lot of research, you see, so I'm going to take that away. <laughs> okay, okay, serious questions here. Um, hang on a second. Um, Ken McCrory has uh, lots of good questions tonight. What's the current situation with power boating in the U.S. at present? Because I haven't introduced you yet as the promoter, but you have been the promoter uh, for NGK um, Formula One series now in the States for four years. This is going to be the fifth? This was going to be the fourth year. Four. 17, 18, 19, and, and 20. So, so you're the um, best man to answer this question. Well, I'm I'm one of I'm one of the pieces to of the course. whole puzzle. Of course. And we have local promoters that we work with that promote the event and then we bring the series in. And it's been going very well. Uh -huh. Last year we averaged um, over 20 boats per event. Mm -hmm. The best event we had, this is only in the Formula 1 class. Mm -hmm. We had 28 Formula 1s on the course at one time. So we got about five new teams coming in this year. Okay. And everybody keeps stepping up their program. So it's been very exciting to watch. Yeah. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, there's just a lot to do um, to, to try and get powerboat racing more of a mainstream sport. Like you, you said, know, the easy part is being the racer. 
It is for sure. But like we were, you know, we were saying before, you know, when you when you film a powerboat race mm. and you do it for the drivers, mm. all they want to see is racing. Mm. They don't want to see anything else. They don't want to see any any part of the backdrop to the whole situation I or the personality. Uh, I had a good discussion on Sunday, it was, with uh, with Sean. He says that, um, uh, in his opinion, he thinks that we should build more on the different characters because he said, you know what, uh, they're whitewashing us, we should all be so politically correct and so on. And he was like even saying, me, Alex Carella, no good match. We don't even like each other, you know? And that, uh, I mean, what do you think about that uh that point to to build more on the characters i mean well, we live in the Kardashian world <laughs> you do because what the program has to do is tell a story exactly so and and the story is is not only the racing but how you get to the racing the people that are the racers their supporting crews families uh the race organization so you've got to show all that which the racers don't like, huh. but that's how we're going to get new fans. You know, we've got to get the casual fan that's flipping through the channels, exactly. sees a boat race and goes, wow, yeah. I've never seen this before. This is cool. And it's got so much to offer. And uh, I don't know if you paid any attention to it, but uh, I have noticed uh, the uh, extreme popularity of the Formula One on Netflix, for example. I mean, that series is... Uh, uh, making Formula One car racing uh, to a whole new audience. So if you haven't seen that one, you you should go out and have a look because it's built on the characters. You know the fights between right. the team managers, and you know they 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 are all very competitive uh, human beings, and that it's for me it's good entertainment. It does, and and you've got to show you know along with showing the character, you got to show the passion. Exactly. Well, guess what? When you're when you're passionate and you're intense about what you're doing, it doesn't mean everything ends up all rosy every time. Don't you I think mean, it would be good TV if uh, they had it on film when you walked up to the guy who bumped you out into the trees? <laughs> oh, well, that's, yeah, some stuff you can show, some stuff you can't. <laughs> but the point the point is that you, you've got to show all the, all the characters exactly. that are involved. Because I think so. Some of the biggest characters are not necessarily the guy that runs in first, second, or third. No. Well, we get a couple of questions more, Tim. Uh, okay. Travis Thompson, he says, uh, Hi, Tim. Can you see the series ever bring back the match racing? Uh, likely not for the 45, but it was exciting to watch for Formula One. Match racing was good. We did that for a while here, like you guys do in the in the Formula Two. Yeah. Um, and that's... A lot of that has to do with how many classes we run and the amount of time that we have. Which brings so us up to the next question, because uh, Joe Frank, he says, uh, Hi, Tim, would you ever consider adding a knee down boat as an exhibiting to your program, uh, sp uh, specifically any U.S. title series classes to help promote gra grassroots racing? Yeah, we would love to do all that, and we and we do have guys that reach out to us all the time. The, it's like you said, time as well. I mean, you it, have only so many hours. It's in very the difficult. When we when we have our Saturday is the biggest uh, time uh, crunch. Yeah. So when we do that, I mean, it's got to be boom. It's it's got to go right down the line because we have got qual testing, qualifying, um, in. So we end up running um, probably t roughly around uh, 15, 15 heats plus testing and qualifying. Yep. So it's it's a tremendous amount just to get it in. Mm. We we always want to promote all of boat racing, not only what we're doing, mm. because you got to cross promote everything. Of course. But um, we just we we got to see where it's always different at each event so we just have to take it take it as it comes and and see if we can do it hmm. i'm bouncing back and forth a little bit here but uh, i hope that's uh, okay by the guys that are following us as well uh, 
And uh, one of the questions which you have not answered is, and I haven't posted it yet, who was the most competitive racer you ever raced again and respected? Wow. Yeah, that's um, a tough one. That's a, that's a long list. And, and when you, you know, you sent me a question that was kind of similar to that. Yeah. So I went and I printed off all the results from 1995 through uh, 2016. Oh. And, you know, I'll just give you a, a rundown. I mean, John Gimo, Fred Miller, uh, Terry Leatherby, and Jimbo McConnell, uh, my dad, my brother, Greg Foster, Scott Gilman, uh, Rusty Campbell, Lynn Simberger, Jason Campbell, Terry Rinker, uh, man, Rick Hoffman, uh, Mark Trotter, Tracy Hawkins. There's a ton of them. Um, and I, and I have respect for, for all those guys yeah. because they, any one of those guys could win a race on any Sunday. Yeah. Right. So when, whenever you would be able to beat them, uh, you, you felt like you accomplished, accomplished something. Exactly. But, um, probably one of my biggest rivals and it's different in the classes, mm. uh, Sean Torrente. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave him out. No. But, um, because you raised you know, him as well, I, didn't you? Who's that? Yeah, you raised Felix. him as well. So, Sean, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Sean, Felix. So in SST 140, my biggest rival was Mark Trotter and and uh, Felix Sorales. Mm -hmm. Felix and I would go back and forth all the time. <laughs> um, in Formula One, Scott Gilman. My dad, Terry Rinker, yeah. my brother, Foster, Jason Campbell, Rusty Campbell. Those are all huge, huge guys. And you go back and you look at all the all the championships, yeah. uh, and and you'll see one year you're fighting with Terry and and Foster, yeah. and then one year you're fighting with Gilman. Yeah, but, you know, I think. I think I lost five more championships in Formula One by a total of less than 10 points. Yeah. Uh, the voice, he said, uh, just over a decade ago, Florida driver Terry Rinker went through the whole season uh, setting a Formula One champ record of winning all seven races in a row. We all remember that. But how did you feel about that streak? And what did you have to, uh, to take the momentum away from him, eventually win more titles later on, you know? I mean, he did well, a phenomenal job. I mean, that that was that was uh, a huge achievement that nobody else has done. Um, Ashton, you know, won last year on all of our events, but Terry, at the time, it was more races, mm -hmm. and it's motivation. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that after that season, we went through every aspect of our team: the driver. The equipment, the meaning the boat, the propellers, the gear cases, yep. uh, the engines, how we collected the data, mm -hmm. how we how we interpreted the data, yep. and all the team members. Mm -hmm. We went through everything because, I mean, that's a huge motivation. That's huge motivation. <laughs> I mean, every time I would get and go on a run or work out. Yeah. I would think about beating Terry Rinker that next year. <laughs> I didn't give a shit about nothing else. No. <laughs> well, fortunately, we we did more testing. We it taught us a lot. We grew a lot, yeah. and we came out and we beat him for the championship the next year. Speaking about championship, uh, Ken is asking: uh, Could European drivers be invited to your race in your series? We have an excellent Norwegian, and he's not thinking about me. He says in the next comment. Sorry, an excellent Norwegian female Formula One driver, <laughs> because Dana was on here last night and uh, with comments. Uh, and uh, I guess it's an open championship, isn't it? Sure, it is. We'd love to have everybody come over, um, anybody that's willing to, and we'll help them out any way we can. Because I know what a challenge it is to either ship equipment and or borrow equipment, and then you get here, and then you gotta you gotta do a bunch of work to it. So. We'd love more um, 
outside people coming, you know, um, the Europeans or, or the guys from the Middle East or Japan or the guys in Australia now have really adopted the same format. Mm. In uh, the beginning of February, I was over there for a race and it kind of kicked off the new format. Mm. And it was fantastic because they had three different engines won the heat races. Really? And, and they had different, and it was all different drivers. Oh, cool. So it's very competitive, and we want to get some of those guys over. But, um, yeah, we we want Stefan Haga. Yeah, is Brent Dillard, he, Brent Dillard, he just Dillard. came on here and he said, uh, I even got to race with Timmy, great man. <laughs> and uh, Brent is uh, bringing Stefan over. Uh, he won my race here in Tunsberg, so... Your American fellows are going to look out for him because he is one aggressive German. Reminds me a lot about Michael in his younger days. And you know how that goes. <laughs> oh, Michael. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Dana, he says, I'll answer for Timmy. Hmm, which one is that? We've had stocks and mods in Springfield to support the NGK. So, uh, okay. Mm. So that was to, to Travis and Joe about the support classes. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's enough time there um, because we don't run the tri hulls in Springfield, yeah. Ohio. Yeah. So then it it gives us a little more time um, to run some other classes. And the nice thing about Springfield too is it's a private lake. Yeah. So we don't have to comply with Coast Guard, um, you know, restrictions uh-huh. about letting the river open. So it, it gives us a little more time. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Dana. You know what we talked about, Dana and I, in our private conversation, uh, we are talking about uh, helping each other, uh, crossing it out, because you have that race on the same weekend as Tunsberg. So we talked about uh, a situation uh, where we could live stream my event over in your pits and in your uh, event and vice versa, because obviously you guys are going to race at night uh, when uh, we don't have any racing, but we have all the facilities in the city set up and so on. So let's see how the... Uh, coronavirus situation is gonna is gonna be right. but uh, that's something we we already spoke about yeah um, you know with the overall it's a world market now definitely. not not so much just a country or whatever so it uh, it definitely helps everybody when we do that yeah uh bob uh Wodinski says toughest course that you have ever raced Love to watch you race in Bay City. So, uh, but uh, your opinion, the toughest race course? Bay City's Bay City's got to be one of the toughest race courses um, because of the, you know, the the water, the backwash coming off the walls. Yeah. And then right down from the ramp, it's always a, it's always a tough uh, corner because there's always a hole there. Twice at Bay City, I crashed on Friday and one on Sunday. Okay. You said uh, in a an, in an YouTube clip I watched this morning, you said, uh, if you want to win Bay City, and this was actually a video where Brent was uh, chasing your tail. You said, you got to do stuff that you normally don't like to do because you're going to go way yeah, you, over. Yeah, you got you to go over the edge. You got you to gotta do stuff you're not comfortable doing because you know it isn't right. Yeah. But if you want to win, that's what you have to do. And I'll tell you how hard of a course Bay City was. That's the one, one of the only venues in the world my dad never won at. Really, he was too smart, wasn't he? And he helped. And he helped. Um, he helped put that start that race. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Him and Chuck Franz. So, I mean, he crashed when he was out front. He broke down when he was out front. But he never, never necessarily got to win that race. Your brother won it, didn't he? Michael won it several. I think my brother won it five times. I've seen some fantastic uh, passing when Madman on the water, you know, Greg and Mike was fighting it out and so on. That uh, was excellent uh, action. Let's put it this way. Another guy that was fantastic there too was Felix Serralis. Oh, yeah. He won several times there. I think Felix won SST 140 and Formula One in the same weekend. Or my brother. My brother did that too, I think. Yeah. There. 
Gene Thornton uh, just made a comment here. He says, damn, I'm glad when all this virus crap is over. I'm ready to cook my jambalaya at the GK F1 races. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gene comes to a lot of the races. Long time, long time boat racer himself. And uh, he always cooks for us in the pits, makes some great jambalaya. Oh, fantastic. Paul from UK says, one thing I really like about public racing is that men and women compete at the same level. We have several female races in Europe. Are there many in uh, racing in US? We have um, a few. We have a few women that um, run in the US. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like everywhere else in the world um, where there's a few uh, women that race. Uh -huh. And um, we're always, that's one thing that we need more of. You, you know, think it we would, need uh, would be very, you think it would be good for a series if a girl like Marit came over and, uh, and uh, encouraged uh, the ladies and the girls over there? I mean, it always does. It always does. It gives them, gives them something to aspire to because they seeing somebody else do it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Sean Bernard uh, says, would you like to have raced more F1H2O like your father and your brother in Europe? And would you have raced Bristol like your dad? Well, given the opportunity, I would have, I would have raced at Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, provided it, I wasn't so young back then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd, I would love to, you know, the big part of racing in, the, in any series but I'd love to go and race the, the F1 H2O more um, if I would have had the opportunity to. You but you got to have races in uh, China. How did, the, how did that compare to your racing uh, in the States? Obviously, I understand the fact that when you have your equipment and you can work with it uh, and test and test and test, you know, you, uh, you get comfortable. But how was your experience? Tell us a little bit about the F1 H2O experience you had. It was good. It was all good, you know, and... And um, we went, and the first first race I ran, I had to run a DAC, and I never even sat in a DAC before. Okay. So I had to go out that. So it's 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 new equipment. Uh -huh. if the engines are different. The props are different. Uh -huh. I don't have any of my own equipment. No. I didn't even have a toolbox. <laughs> so we went over. We ran uh, Lin Yi, and then uh, and we. I think I think I got uh, fifth at that race, and then we went. Everybody was making fun of me because I stayed out there and tested for so long. Yeah. I was trying to figure the boat out and everything else. Oh, of course, what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and then we ran an, another race, uh, Lo Ju, I think. Yeah. And um, we ended up fourth at that one, I believe. Again, it had to switch boats. That time I ran a Baba, hmm. and it never been in a Baba before. We uh, rented it off of, um, oh, gosh darn it, the, uh, the German guy that was racing at ah, the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Carl Slow. Yeah. And then we, and then after that, we went to another race. I ran the Baba again. I think I ended up seventh. Okay. That's good. That's good. Um, one of the names I recall from racing in uh, in the States was uh, Carlos Curry and Carlos Guzman. He says, I just sent Carlos a part of this interview since he's not on Facebook. He says he's glad to see you and have very good memories of all of you in Formula One. Oh, yeah. We we uh, we used to build the boats for Carlos. Yeah. And uh, we worked with him a lot. And Bob Schubert was his, his crew chief and team manager and... And uh, he made fantastic fact, promotion back in the days. Yeah, oh yeah, he was way ahead of it. I still got wrist watches, and you know he did a he did a deal, a trademark agreement mm -hmm. for Speedy Gonzalez. Yeah, at the time, yeah. and had that on all his stuff. But yeah, Carlos was a wizard at at the promotion. Oh, definitely, he was a great guy too. Great guy. Ken is asking: Do Mercury still give you support? Mercury, Mercury is is uh, we're currently working with Mercury. There's there's no um, support per se right at this moment, but we're we're working towards that, mm -hmm. and it's all about a mutual 
uh, agreement. You know, we've got to be able to come in and run some current year product with them uh, to get them excited. So provided um, their four stroke works, uh, they may work on another version, which is a 250 horse range mm -hmm. uh, version. And that would be in line with what we're doing. And um, yeah, we'll continue to, we always want Mercury support. You know, they've been in it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bleed, I bleed Mercury, you know, I've been I with know. them for so long and my family. So it's good. I have a 2019 recap uh, I would like to uh, show to our followers. So have a look at this one and we will uh, catch up once the video has finished. The 2019 NGK F1 Powerboat Series. On board, Ashton Rinker. Right up on Fairchild for the lead. Now he's going for the lead. Oh, boy. That's going to get tight. The 20 will take the win. 15 years ago was the last time the Formula One boats had run in Toledo. Oh, and the rear cowling goes flying. And Rinker with Fairchild just to his right. Oh, no. Oh, boy, a big incident. Rinker still at the front of the field. Oh, and look at this. Right in front of our leader goes Hawkins into the water. And Ashton Rinker will lead every lap for the win here today here on the Saginaw River in Bay City, Michigan. Breaker trying to use his speed on the outside. About 10 laps in, really gonna get choppy. Look at Rinker bouncing through there. Dustin Terry with major problems. And Rusty Wyatt's gonna come by. Ashton Rinker wins his third in a row of the 2019 season. It looks like they bumped in. Oh, they did! Rinker continuing the lead with Wyatt and Fairchild running second and third. A problem for Rusty oh, Wyatt no. on the final lap. What a spectacular sight here in Windsor, Colorado. Chris Fairchild pulling away from the dock. Oh, and another boat going over. Ashton Rinker in the lead. Greg Foster is running a strong second. Ashton Rinker will claim the championship. It feels fantastic not only just to win the series, become a national champion as well for ABBA. We're very excited. We're, we're just pumped. We're ready for 2020. That was Rinker saying he is ready for 2020. When do you think that's going to be, Timmy? I wish I knew. Yeah. You know, with the uncertainty of everything that's going on around the world these days and in the U.S., um, there's no, there's no timeline on any of this. And that's, that's probably the hardest thing for all of us to accept is the fact that we don't know when or what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully our, our next round that, that we're looking towards is Bay city. But again, we don't know what this will do. Number one, the timeline. Uh -huh. And if things start going back to normal, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to allow group gatherings or, or events. Mm. And then on top of that is the fact that we don't know how this is going to affect everybody involved in an event mm. financially, yep. meaning the sponsors uh, in everything that they're going through right now, mm. will they be able to promote? Mm. And the last thing is, 
the public perception. Mm -hmm. So the last thing that anybody wants to do is put the wrong perception out there mm -hmm. that they're either doing this too soon yeah. or that they're doing it at all afterwards. Have they, so, said, have they said anything in Norway? Uh, you know, I'm very concerned about this as well because obviously I have two events. I organize a boat show and I organize the race in August. Uh, so what the government has said in Norway is that all activity uh, until 15.6 is uh, canceled and not allowed. Uh, after 15.6, which means uh, July, August and so on, they will answer us on the before the 1st of May. Have you ever have you any news or information like that from the government? That has they given you any deadlines? No, the the last the last thing that they've kind of put out is the fact that they wanted to go through April. Okay. And then at the end of April, they're going to and I'm sure they're going to do it before then, but they will they will have an evaluation and see the direction, but Believe me, everybody wants this uh, to get going, uh, meaning the the economy again, people's jobs, the important stuff, not not necessarily racing, because uh, there's bigger things here than us. But like I used to say these days, you know, out of the non-important things, power racing is the most important things to get going. You know, that's <laughs> that's that's what we feel all over the over the world. Well. The, the thing that powerboat racing can do when it comes back is be that outlet for people to go and enjoy themselves and get away from the daily life that or lockdown yeah. that we've been in yeah. for the past. Really, it, I mean, it's been over a month for a lot of us. Of course, of course. Um, I'm talking to a lot of uh, sports organizers and event makers and so on. And one of the scenarios is also that we can have a situation where we are allowed to have competitions, uh, but we're not allowed to have spectators. Uh, is that an option for you as a promoter to to set up events where there are actually not allowed to have uh, gatherings of people? I don't. No, not really. I you, don't believe you're doing that's a great television show. You know. Because for us, the attraction is on site mm -hmm. for the sponsors, for the teams, for the publicity. Now, if we had a big television contract that we were making money off of, let's say like NASCAR or Formula One, yeah. where they can do this race mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily matter if the people are in the stands because they can reach out through the television and it it um, oh, it, it, they can check that box off and, and it gets them uh, that part of their contract done mm -hmm. and it still gets the race out to the people where the teams can keep their sponsors. It's unreal because uh, when I read your bio, it spans like 40 years and your family more than 70. Has, have we ever been in a situation like this? No. Absolutely not. Never. You know, I mean, as far as as far as the world and the economy, no. As far as powerboat racing, you know, in 85, around 85, 86, where they had so many, uh, that's the pre-capsule uh -huh. era, and they had so many deaths around Capsules, the world yeah. in Formula One, that changed the scope of things. And they stopped racing until they figured out a solution, yeah. which... The solution was the safety caps. Hmm. Gene Thornton says we need St. Louis race back, uh, race site back. What do you think? Is that possible? We we get I get that question all the time, and we would love to go back to St. Louis. We'd have to run at Creve Coeur Park, is where the race moved uh, probably from 2000 on. Yeah. Um, because George Winter, they is just it's a river. Mm -hmm. And it's all sand, and they don't allow them to dredge down there in that area anymore. Okay. So it's we couldn't even race at George Winter if we wanted to. Uh, okay. But Creve Coeur, we could. Yeah. So we have been working with a couple people to um, ignite that idea yeah. and get them involved because it takes a local group to do any of these races. Mm -hmm. So we need local promoters in the area that are uh, boots on the ground 
daily so that they can get everything we need in order to bring in the show. Uh, just throwing one in here now. I know that you're working with a lot of local uh, promoters and organizers, and uh, and like you said, you have to. Uh, Marine Stadium in Miami. What about that one? Uh, are we going to see a powerboat race, of a um, NGK race uh, down there? Well, never say never. Um, there's there's some difficulties right now. I we. I had several conversations and we got close last year with Awesome mm -hmm. and the P1 people mm -hmm. to, to do um, a combined event yeah. down there. Mm -hmm. um, financially, it didn't work out for us. Okay. And I think they've got some things in place because I, I stay in contact with Awesome and um, they're working on several things that can um, help with the marine wildlife. Yeah. Which is always a problem when you race in the salt water, right. uh, whether it be on the Florida coast or or anywhere around the US. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, that's one of the things that we're working on. We're also working on some older races, um, older race sites to bring them back. We've got um, Lake Havasu that we're talking to that because like they've they've got a, a big anniversary coming up of the London Bridge. Uh, in Havasu next year. Okay. So we're talking to them to see if that works. Um, and it's just, you know, it's got to be a fit for both both sides. Uh, let's see here then. Jim Hall says, uh, this may have been asked already, but is the Bay City event still happening in June or being pushed back uh, possibly? Hopefully not totally cancelled. Well, you sort of answered that, didn't you? Well, yeah, it's the the dates for Bay City are July twelfth, tenth uh, through the twelfth. So again, we're just going to have to see. You know, Michigan's been in a lockdown, and around uh, oh, in the next week or two, I I think we'll have a lot more information for the rest of the season. But we want to, you know, if we have a season, we want to have enough races to make it a series. That's so right. we. What we don't want to do is have one or two races and then call it a series because that wouldn't be right. No. Maybe what we do then, and I, and I have no idea what's going to happen, but, you know, in that case, we might have a couple individual races rather than a series for this year, yeah. but it depends how all this lays out. When do you think you're going to have uh, a new schedule uh, out? Are we talking a month, two? What is the, uh, what is your perception on that? I would say my goal is by the end of this month, but but in order for us to do that, we have to see where the country is exactly. and and where the restrictions are that we all want to follow for everybody's safety and health. First and foremost, we uh, wish uh, everyone to be safe and, and healthy. And uh, well, uh, I'm grateful that you found the time, uh, Timmy, to to be with me tonight on. Uh, this little pro uh, program, which I call the Race Factory, because uh, I have to do something in the Race Factory, you know, and uh, and uh, to promote some powerboat racing is is always something we we love. There is a small little challenge for you here in the end, which is uh, from Joe Frank. He says, uh, given the opportunity, would you take a pro outboard for a ride, kneeling in the cockpits? <laughs> sure. Anything sure, goes, huh? I've, I've had the opportunity to um, drive some different uh, boats along the way. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I'd be very fast in it because I think those days are older for me. I'm too old. <laughs> but uh, you don't you don't know. Um, you never know what happens. But it, it's always fun to take a ride in something. Definitely. And talking about fun, I have been riding the internet, you know, browsing and, and so on. I found a picture which I just popped up next to you now. Obviously, it's Jake, uh, you know very well, and a group of friends. I think it's a prize giving, and uh, your wife's here. What's the occasion? Oh, that one. Uh, that's when I won the championship in 1999. Okay. And uh, that was at the awards banquet at the end of the year for the prop tour, and uh, I proposed to Debbie. Really? So you're an effective man. You proposed during a prize giving. <laughs> Did you give it a trophy yeah. or? <laughs> I called. Uh, 
I, one of our crew guys, uh, Chuck Sturdy, we call him Charles the Truth. Yeah. He's a pawnbroker. <laughs> and I went to him before I left and I said, hey, Chuck, I've been thinking about asking Debbie to marry me. I need a ring. Yeah. He goes, okay, when you get back, you know, we'll, I'll take you to some places and we'll look at him. I said, no, I need it for this weekend. So Chuck put Chuck picked the ring out. I didn't because I don't know anything about it anyway. <laughs> Thanks God, Debbie is not uh, listening to this one. <laughs> well, she knows the story. She knows the story. <laughs> After thirty years, she kind of knows all these stories. Exactly, exactly. She's still with you and helping you to. I brought the picture up to uh, to uh, also uh, share a few words about Debbie because she has been with you uh, for all these years of racing, and she still is, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Part of the organization yeah. and everything. We just, uh, yeah, she's she's always uh, the backbone of the su support farming. And um, you can't do it without them. That's for sure. She helps me out. And uh, it's it's a good uh, partnership. Well, uh, Jody Mason says, uh, tell Tim, Jody from South Africa says hi. And we have uh, a lot of good comments here in the end. Uh, Jim Holt says, I'm 37 and I've been watching you race in Bay City my entire life. Glad you're running the show now. And uh, we have a lot of friends saying that they enjoyed the show. So Tim Siebel, champion and uh, promoter for Formula One, thank you very much for uh, being with me tonight. And uh, hopefully we entertained a few and hopefully we can uh, continue to promote Powerboat Racing and soon be out in a race boat. Okay, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I want to say, you know, hi to all the fans and thanks for tuning in. Um, I also want to give a shout out to NGK. I've been with them for 20 years now and they stick behind us. And uh, they've been part of my life for over, you know, 20 years now. So thank you and uh, we look forward to the future. Val Collins will round it off with saying big thanks to all the race promoters who keeps the sport moving forward. We are behind you while going through this difficult period of time. So I think that's a good one to, to wrap it up. Oh, yeah. Val's great on stuff. She she writes all our press releases, so she knows how to word it, how it <laughs> needs to be. I'm just the mouthpiece. <laughs> a good one. Okay, Timmy. <laughs> see you later. Bye. Bye-bye.